In this video, I'm going to read diary entries um, August 31st through September 7th. So essentially, we'll start at the bottom of page 172 and go through the top of page 208. Um, this is more of a kind of a guided reading video. You can stop, pause, make annotations, notate key details and concepts as you read. Um, the activity that goes along with this section of entries is at the end you are going to have to give me three examples, at least three examples, with an explanation and text evidence of separation and unification either in these entries or in the novel overall. And um, with unification, let me, let me clarify, I'm talking about new unities between people, religions, families, relationships, um, countries, Things becoming one, people becoming one, being united, okay, separation, things being, you know, pulled from one another, um, so uh, that's the activity that you'll complete um, after you're done reading these entries. Okay, um, the bottom of page 172, and I'll stop along the way too and give you some of my own annotations and thoughts about certain sections in the novel. Uh, this is my favorite section of the Night Diary novel. Okay, August 31st, 1947. Dear Mama, when I woke up, I was lying on a bed, a real bed with a patterned blanket. I thought for a moment we were back in our house. Emil and Papa were hovering over me. It was strange to be inside. Then I remembered, this was your home, Mama. There was also a new person staring at me, standing by a doorway. I looked at him. He wasn't too tall. He wore a topi on his head and a tan kurta. He dressed like Kazi, but his face was not like Kazi's at all. Something was wrong with it. He stood out of the light of the two candles burning on the table, and I couldn't quite see, but his lip was raised up in the middle, exposing his gum and a few crooked teeth. His lip seemed like it was connected to the bottom of his nose. Back in Nurparkas, a dried fruit vendor at the market had always worn a scarf over his mouth and nose, and Papa said it was because he had a cleft palate and showed me in his medical book what it was. Some people are born with it, Papa said, and most people could never afford the surgery to fix it. Sometimes hospitals helped if the person couldn't eat or swallow. There was also a girl in my school, Mittal. She didn't wear a scarf over her face. Her lip went up in the middle and touched her nose. She never spoke, like me. I don't know if it was because she couldn't or didn't want to. I suppose she could eat, because then she would have had the surgery. I never saw her doing so, though. I would try to look at her for more than a second, but I always turned away. I wanted to not care. I wanted to be her friend, because she didn't have any. I only had Sabine, who I wasn't even sure was a real friend, because I never spoke to her. But it was too hard to look at Mittal. I'm so ashamed when I think about it, which is why I usually don't. Did you have trouble looking at Rashid Uncle Mama? Were you a coward like me? I'm sure you were not. This is Rashid Uncle. He can't speak, only write, Papa said in his doctor voice. Rashid Uncle nodded at me. Can you stand? Papa asked. I started to move. My neck hurt and it all flooded back to me. The memory like water filling an empty space. I remembered the man, his blade pressed to my neck, Emil yelling, Papa arriving just in time and coming here. I stood and looked around the airy room with a colorful woven carpet on the floor and a carved chest of drawers that reminded me of my own, and I felt the sting of the memory. There was another bed on the opposite wall. Dottie lay there, asleep, her chest rising and falling slowly. I started to walk, my curiosity taking over, and Papa followed me. I stepped carefully into the hallway and passed another open door. I looked in and saw a similar room, but smaller, with one bed along the window and another along the opposite wall. I peered into the third room. It had one large bed, a detailed tapestry hanging on the wall, a carpet, and a chest of drawers. I also saw an easel in the corner with a blank canvas on it. I thought it must be Rashid Uncle's room. I walked under an archway to a formal sitting room with a long couch, several wooden chairs, 
embroidered pillows, and a low carved table in the middle. Paintings also hung on the walls. One was of a blue ocean against an even bluer sky in the first room. Another pictured a vase of flowers. I also saw a painting of a beautiful woman sitting cross-legged on the grass under a tree. It was you, Mama. I just know it. In the dining room sat a table with six chairs and a heavy china cabinet with glass doors. A porcelain vase of pink and purple flowers stood in the center of the table, just like the painting. It was such a lovely place. So my thought was, well, who painted these? Did Rashid Uncle paint these, or was it her mama? Because we know that she was um, a wonderful artist. I turned thinking Papa was right behind me and found myself looking at Rashid Uncle's face. That's when I noticed his eyes. They look just like the picture of you, even more than Emil's do. Maybe there's a reason for all of this. I know this is a terrible thought, but if we never had to leave, we wouldn't have some we wouldn't have come here and had a chance to see Rashid Uncle's eyes, your eyes, alive. I quickly looked away. Now, um I see here that Nisha has had a shift in her perspective, right? Right now she's seeing something positive from being separated uh, from her home and being unified with her uncle. Okay, notice those key words, separate, separation and unification that I just mentioned. You can wash over, he over there. Papa pointed toward a doorway in the back of the kitchen. I scrubbed my hands, face, and neck over the metal basin. I would need a full bath later to peel the layers of grime away, but it was so nice to see the skin on my hands not caked with dirt. How do you feel? Papa asked after I was done. Okay, I said in a small, scratchy voice. I saw one more painting in the kitchen. It was of Rashid Uncle himself, his face. I walked closer and studied the painting, his strange upturned mouth, like an invisible string pulled his top lip up from the middle the shock of pink gum showing, the lopsided teeth one almost the lopsided teeth one almost on top of another, his flat nose. It was easier to look at the picture than the real Rashid uncle. I can't believe he paints. Did you teach him or did he teach you? Nisha, come, Papa said sternly. I jumped, startled, and turned away and turned away from the painting. I followed him to the back of the house to check on Dobby. Her pale face turned up to the ceiling, breathing weakly. He bent down toward Dottie and touched her arm. She opened her eyes and nodded, then closed her eyes again. Papa headed to the kitchen. Emil had stayed with Dottie the entire time I walked through the house. Are you okay? he asked. I think so, I said. I thought, I thought he was going to kill you, Emil said, his bottom lip trembling slightly. His eyes looked glassy. Papa was always going to come, I said, touching his hand and quickly shift my gaze back to Dottie, trying to be a little brave for Emil, since he was so brave when we didn't have water. So I love how it, how the author shows us how much Emil and Nisha admire one another here, and they can now both connect to these seemingly near-death experiences, um, and, and each wanting to be brave for the other. But I thought that he was going to kill me too. The man could have easily slit my throat, and in a minute I would have been dead. There was nothing Papa could have done. There was something about having it happen that made me less scared instead of more scared. I don't know why. He was such a sad and frightened man. The way his hand shook. Why, did he, why had his family been killed? Why would anyone do that? Do people who kill start out like me? Or are they a different kind of human? That's a pretty deep thought by Nisha um, and, and her contemplating here more about the man than about herself and what the man has been through and why would this happen? Who could do something like this? Um, so just you know, take a minute, think about that and, and make some connections here. It's strange that Rashid Uncle lives in this big house all alone. Did you see the paintings? I'm on page 178. Emil pumped his head up and down and grinned. I guess that's why I can draw. Then his face grew serious again. Do you think Dottie is going to die? No, I whispered back harshly. 
Can't you see she's just tired? But I was thinking it too. I'm going to ask Papa, Emil said, his eyes again bright and searching. I grabbed his arm to stop him, but he slipped away from me and marched toward Papa and Rashid Uncle. I followed him down the long hallway, through the sitting room and dining room, and into the kitchen. Papa stopped talking, goofy, and they both looked at Emil. Emil gave Rashid Uncle one of his big, open smiles, and my heart almost exploded. Emil has this way of smiling that makes you believe the world is a good place for at least that second. I feel differently about Emil now. I can't explain it. It's like he died and came back to life. I always liked his smile, but it makes me so happy now, like the first time I'm really seeing it. What would I do without Emil? He is my voice. He asks the questions I can't. Yes, Papa said. Emil's smile disappeared. Is Dobby going to die? Papa's eyes stayed on Emil. I won't let her, he said, and then he left to check on her. But something about the stiff way Papa spoke made my stomach hurt. I reminded myself that Papa was a doctor. He had powers regular people didn't have. Did you think that about him, Mama? But then I thought about Emil. What saved Emil was really the rain, but it was Papa too. Even if it hadn't rained, he still brought the water Emil needed. The way he stopped the man from hurting us and the way he was kind to him after. Papa might be the bravest person I know, but what Papa doesn't know is that Emil was almost as brave. I'm the coward. What did I do when the man attacked me? I froze. It was Emil who yelled and alerted Papa. It was Emil who said they had guns. Okay, and here we see Nisha taking up for Emil, even to Mama, um, in this in this section. Rashid Uncle lit a fire in the enormous stove and boiled a pot of lentils. Then he chopped an onion. The smell tickled my nose. I moved a little closer. So did Emil. We watched as he fried the onion in a big pan and sprinkled in some mustard seed, garlic, salt, cumin, turmeric, and chopped ginger. He stirred the spices for another minute and poured in the boiled lentils. You don't have a cook? Emil asked Uncle. I knew it was a rude question. But a big house needs a cook and a gardener and someone to tend to the housework. Rashid's uncle didn't do all that by himself, did he? He looked up and shrugged, then went back to his stirring. Watching Rashid's uncle stir the steamy doll sent me spinning back to Kazi cooking in her kitchen, back to Dottie doing her normal caring for the house, rocking in her chair, back to Papa coming home from the hospital, kissing our foreheads goodnight. Back to me and Emil falling asleep with the taste of sweets on our tongues and thoughts of the things that happened at school that day. And here we see the author use um, a flashback to take us back to the, the memories that Nisha has. It had all been so ordinary, even boring, and now it seemed like a fairy tale. Tears started to fall. I couldn't help it. I put my face in my hands to cover them. Nish, Emil said. What is it? I just shook my head. Rashid uncle, can she stir? Emil asked. Rashid uncle stopped and turned. I forced myself not to look down, and he held out the spoon. I blinked my tears away, stuck the spoon in the pot, and leaned over the warm yellow doll. I stirred so it wouldn't stick to the bottom. My body began to relax, and I stirred some more. Emil knew me so well. All this time, I thought he was just jumping around our house, trying to get out of chores and schoolwork just so he could play in the garden or draw. But now I see how closely he's watched me, how well he knows me, how much he has inside him. We stood there quietly for several minutes before Papa came over. I heard his footsteps stop and he watched me. After the doll was done, I put it aside. Rashid Uncle opened up a pantry door and scooped some rice from a metal canister. He gave it to me and I poured in the right amount for five people. I watched his face. This time, it was a little easier to look at him than it was minutes before. I stayed focused on his eyes. He took out a metal cup filled with water from a large jug to pour in the pot. He handed it to me and I poured. We put in four cups and waited for the water to boil. Kazi always boiled the water first excuse me, before putting the rice in, but I didn't say anything. Rashid Uncle didn't seem like the most experienced cook. 
He chopped the onions every which way and didn't rinse the ginger anywhere near as fine as Cosy would have. Maybe he had a cook who had to leave, a Hindu cook. My hunger started to make me dizzy. It hurt not to bring spoonful after spoonful into my mouth. When it was done, Rashi Uncle took out five bowls, and I spooned rice and dal into four of them, and then one with just rice. He unwrapped four chapatis from a cloth and warmed them on the stove and stuck them on the sides of the bowls. I looked at the bowls, filled to the top with golden dal and rice, the toasted chapati sitting in the corner. It was the most food I had seen since we left home. I wondered if he always had such simple meals, but nothing had seemed so perfect to me. Take this to Dottie, Papa said to me, and handed me the plain bowl of rice. I nodded and swallowed, the saliva collecting in my hungry mouth, cradling the warm bowl in my hands, and snuck a large pinch of rice. The sounds of chairs moving and the bowls being set down on the table startled me as I went into the other room. It was still strange to be inside, sitting at a proper dining room table for dinner. Dottie had her eyes closed. I spoke her name and asked her to eat. Nothing happened. I put the rice under her nose and waited. After a few seconds, she opened her eyes and gave me a crooked nod. Then she waved me away. I looked in her face. It was drawn and dull. I will feed you, I said. She stayed still, so I scooped a bit of rice into my hand and pressed it to her lips. She shook it and chewed. We did this a few more times. Then she put up her hand for me to stop. Good girl, she whispered. I put my hand over hers and held it there. After a minute, I left the bowl of rice next to her and went into the other room. Emil, Papa, and Rashi Uncle had waited for me to eat. It must have been so hard for Emil and even Papa to do that. I sat down next to Emil and across from Papa. Then I ate. The rice, the dal, the chapatis exploded with flavor. I could taste the rich ghee, each grain of rice, each speck of cumin, the tang of ginger, garlic, onion. It was the best food I've ever eaten in my life. No one spoke. After several large bites, I looked up at Papa and Emil, scooping up food with their chapatis fast and greedy. When we finished, there was enough for us to have seconds. After the silent meal, Papa put his hand on Rashid Uncle's shoulder. I will never be able to repay the kindness you have shown us. You have shown us. Rashid Uncle nodded and quickly started to clear the table. We helped him clean the pots and dishes, and then we were each able to shower. It took me a long time to get clean. I watched the brown water run down the drain and was afraid I'd use it all up. I didn't know I could ever get so dirty. Emil and I asked to share the middle room. Papa slept in Dottie to keep an eye on her. We got into bed and covered ourselves in our mosquito nets, feeling clean and new. Emil wondered if we could hide here until the fighting went away and then live here forever. I hoped so more than anything. If any new home made sense to me, this would be it. Then Cosy could come and live here eventually. Can I send that wish to you, Mama? Is this the bed you slept in? One more thing. Please watch over Dottie. I can't lose her right now. Love, Nisha. I think page 185. September 1st, 1947. Dear Mama, it is a new month and exactly 17 days since the world changed. Is there another family living in our house yet? A happier family. Do they have more children with a mother and a father? I won't let myself think of our house burning to the ground or of Causey sad and lonely. I try to think of everything alive, the garden colorful and bursting with vegetables, better than it was when we were there. I think of more children running around. Four, two boys and two girls, a mother calling them in for supper, checking to make sure their nails are clean, hugging them for no reason. I see a father coming home early, surprising everyone with rock candy sticks from the market. Excuse me again, I'm so sorry. Telling heroic stories from the hospital every night before bed. I think of the littlest girl finding Dee, my old doll in the closet. It's the best surprise she ever got. Love, Nisha. Nisha. Page 186. September 2nd, 1947. Dear Mama, Papa says Rashid Uncle's house is a bit over halfway to the border. We still have many miles to go. 
When I ask Papa about when we're leaving, he says soon, but he wants Dottie stronger before we do. I want to stay, but I'm also starting to feel trapped. The owl? We have a big owl in our backyard tree. Sorry. even been able to hear it. Okay, sorry. Oh, I wish I had heard that. Oh, we have a big owl that's probably got like a six foot wingspan. It's huge. So we have to be careful when we let our dogs out. I thought that's what y'all said. Okay, maybe four and a half. Maybe four and a half foot. Okay, my husband's correcting me. Okay, so we have to be careful if we let the dogs out early in the morning because we're worried about the owl taking them away because our dogs are smaller. And that's my husband singing. Okay, back to the night diary. I want to stay, but I'm also starting to feel trapped. We're not allowed to go outside. We're not supposed to be here. And I don't know what would happen if someone found out. Both Emil and I have heard Papa and Dottie talk about what they've read in the papers. I know lots of people have died walking and on the trains in both directions. The riots and killings keep happening. I still don't understand. We were all part of the same country last month. All these different people and religions living together. Now we're supposed to separate and hate one another? Does Papa secretly hate Rashid Uncle? Does Rashid Uncle secretly hate us? Where do Emil and I fit into all of this hate? Can you hate half of a person? Okay, so I want to go back to um, Nisha's statement um, that, you know, they were all part of the same country last month. They were different people, different religions, and they were all living together. They were all unified. And now, all of a sudden, they're supposed to separate and hate one another. Okay, think about that. Um, that is an example of separation and unification both. Okay, so in your, as you're, if you're taking notes, as you watch this video or listen to me read, that's a good section to note right there. Okay, 187. Rashid Uncle moves around the house so quietly. I worry that he's angry and wishes we weren't here. He worries that he gets food for us at the market and brings water from the well. I heard Papa ask him to go to two different markets so it won't look like more people are staying here. He nodded. Then Papa tried to give him money, but he wouldn't take it. I hope that means he wants to help us. Emil and I play guessing games and make up little stories and dances to keep ourselves busy. In the stories, I always start with a girl or a boy, and he or she is running from something like a man with a gun or a knife or a big fiery torch. I say something bad that happens to the character, and Emil says something good. Then I say something bad, or we do it the opposite way. At the end, the character always dies. We try to make the death worse every time. The worse the death, the funnier we find the story. We try to laugh quietly, which makes it even funnier. We would have never made up stories like this before, and we would have never found them funny. Emil says it's because nothing's real right now. I know what he means. Page 188. Meals are my favorite time because I helped Rashi Uncle cook. I just started doing it that first night, and no one has told me to stop. We make simple things, dal, rice, Finish cooked with tomatoes, chapatis. I do most of it. I still wonder if Uncle always ate in this simple way. He makes sure I have the right bowls or the proper amount of rice, but seems happy for me to cook. I make the same things I watched Kazi cook all my life. But cooking with Rashid Uncle is nothing like cooking with Kazi. He doesn't look at me, and he can't talk to me, so it's silent. I want to ask him so many questions about you, Mama, but I'm too afraid. Not being able to ask him questions pains me in a new way. It's like I'm sick with all the words I hold on to and can't say. When Papa talks to Uncle, he writes back quickly and doesn't seem annoyed. Emil and Dottie talk to him too sometimes. I noticed there was something familiar about Rashid Uncle. His movement, his bent head, the way he holds his shoulders. But I couldn't place it. Then I noticed the way he took a bowl from the table and circled it carefully with his long fingers. It reminded me of myself. So maybe he's like you, Mama, which means you and I are alike. I want to tell him this, yet I can't. 
I've looked through the house to try and find some signs of you, maybe a piece of jewelry or a scarf, but I don't even know what I'm looking for. How did I get to be this way? I'm just like Brushy Dunkle, born with a defect that makes it hard to speak. Even impossible, except that you can't see mine. Or maybe it's my fault. I'm just not, I'm just not strong enough. If we leave here, I may never see Brushy Dunkle again. It is my only chance to find out more about you, and I can't even say one word to him. Emil talks to Rashi Dunkle, but Rashi Dunkle only nods or writes down a word or two. He seems more comfortable with Papa, but maybe Emil won't mind asking some questions for me. I wish we could go outside and play. Then my mind wouldn't have so much time to think about the bad things. The good thing is that Dottie seems to have gained some strength from the food and rest. She still sleeps a lot, but spends time awake, praying and singing her song softly. She's eating more. She stayed up with Papa tonight after dinner in the sitting room. Emil and I lay on the couch, and I read him the, sc the scorpion section in the encyclopedia. Rashi Dunkle sat at the dining room table and carved some wood. It made me feel like we've all lived here in this house our whole lives, and nothing was wrong at all. When Rashi Dunkle comes home after working at his furniture business and going to the market, he sits at the table and carves. He's working on a small bowl and a horse. I secretly watch him. Maybe Uncle will teach us how to carve. He seems to have magical fingers. He makes all the ridges and bumps look so smooth, like they were never even there. Love, Misha. September 3rd, 1947 Dear Mama, today I saw something. It was a normal thing to see, but to me, I thought I might be dreaming. That's what Emil means about things not feeling real. A regular person can seem like a vision. I was looking out the window. There is a house maybe a hundred feet away. Our bedroom window looks toward the other house's back patio and garden. I was watching a dry leaf swirl and twist in the wind, and she suddenly appeared. Why hadn't I noticed her before? I closed my eyes for a second, wondering if she would be there when I opened them. She remained, even clearer than before, with a glistening black braid down her back, simply playing, not running or hiding, just being. I turned quickly to tell Emil and saw him drawing on some newspaper advertisements that Dottie gave him. He sat on the floor, cross-legged, his back to me, hunched over his work, and I decided to keep watching without saying a word. <coughs> The girl lay sticks on the ground in circles. Then she stood and tossed pebbles into them. I squinted and watched her more. She spun around, smiled, and moved her mouth like she was talking to herself until she was called in, probably by her mother. It was hard to tell, but she looked about my age, maybe a little younger. Does she not have any siblings? I never knew anyone who didn't, and I wonder if something bad happened to them. As I watched her play, I felt the urge to climb out the window and join her. The desire felt so strong I had to grip the window sill to keep me in my place. She disappeared as quickly as she appeared. If I were allowed to play with her, I would talk to her. I promise, Mama. I wouldn't waste it. It's like the rules are different now. I wonder what would happen if she saw me. Love, Misha. And I'm on page 192. September 4th, 1947. Dear Mama, I didn't see the girl today. I probably imagined her, or maybe I just dreamed of her, and my memory is all mixed up. But I couldn't stop thinking about it. Rashi Dunkle stayed out most of the day, then carved wood outside under a tree. I really want to be friendly with him so I can find out more about you, but he doesn't seem to want to be with us. All Papa and Dottie do is read the papers, discuss things in whispers, and drink cup after cup of watery tea. Rashi Dunkle brings back food, which is the most exciting part of the day. I try to read the papers, but Papa and Dobby don't let us. I manage to see, excuse me, looks at the headlines. Sometimes I see a string of words. India-Pakistan officials discuss new potential violence, or communal strife continues, or Gandhi fast for peace. Then they shoo me away. Papa did talk a little about Gandhi's fast. He told us Gandhiji said he wouldn't eat until people stopped fighting. Maybe it will work. Maybe tomorrow will be the day we taste true freedom. 
At night, they take the papers to bed with them and hide them under their mattresses or have Rashi Dunkel put them outside. Why don't they want me to see what I already know now, that the world is broken? Love, Nisha. Page 194. September 5th, 1947. Dear Mama, I did something today, Mama. I'm not sure why I did it after everything that happened with the moon in this night. I know now that this new world is dangerous. But are Emil and I just supposed to live here inside like prisoners? I'm so sorry, Mama. Your house is lovely. But lately I feel so angry and I don't know why or exactly at who. What would Gandhiji say? Would he be disappointed in me? Papa would. I just want to be free. Wasn't independence from the British supposed to free us? We've never been less free. The girl came back when Emil, Papa, and Dottie were in the dining room. Papa now lets Emil sit at the table and draw. Papa knows Emil is not going to try to read over his shoulder. I don't mind being alone. I wanted to watch out the window in case I wasn't dreaming. She didn't come out all morning, but then after lunch she was there, as if she had been there all along. When I saw her, I felt like someone threw cold water in my face. I'm not imagining things. She is real. She sat on the ground, braiding and unbraiding her hair, biting her lip with a scowl. Each time she did it, she shook her head and started to undo it. After a while, she looked up. I raised my head fully over the window ledge. I waited for her to look in my direction. Papa, Dottie, and Emil seemed quiet enough. She turned toward me and I stuck my hand out the window and waved. She seemed to raise her hand as if to wave back, but then she lowered it and quickly ran inside. My heart beat so fast I thought my chest was going to explode. What if she told her family I was there? Would we be in danger? Would people come after us like the man in the woods did? I spent the rest of the day sitting in my corner, sitting in the corner, staring at my feet. I was probably too far away for her to see me, I tried to tell myself. I was afraid if I moved, something terrible would happen. What's wrong, Nisha? Emil asked me. Nothing, I said. But something is, Emil said. I can tell. I'm just sad, I told him. He nodded, carefully looking at my face. You don't look sad. You look scared, he finally said. Page 196. Just go away, I murmured. Sometimes I hated that Emil knew me so well. I didn't dare look out the window again, and nothing happened. Love, Nisha. September 6, 1947. Dear Mama, This morning I decided to just peek out the window for a second, and there she was. Nobody came to talk to us or heard us since I waved yesterday. Emil sat on his bed drawing pictures in the air, humming softly to himself. I was glad he wasn't paying attention. She sat on the ground. I couldn't see exactly what she was doing. I lifted up the window. I lifted, yeah, I lifted up the window and leaned out a bit. It looked like she was weaving necklaces and bracelets out of weeds. That was something I always liked to do outside. I remembered the party when we left, weaving necklaces with my cousins. Could it really be so wrong if I played with her? After she finished, my head turned toward me, her head turned toward me again. I moved closer to the center of the open window and she looked me dead in the eye. After a few seconds, I waved again, holding my breath. This time, she waved quickly before running back inside. A tingly feeling ran through my body, like I had opened a gift covered in shiny English wrapping paper and bows. What are you waving at? Emil asked me, looking up from the floor. Nothing, I said. He got up and looked outside. Then he looked back at me. Did you see someone out there? I didn't answer. He watched me, hands on his bony hips, squinting harder and harder. We stood there for a minute in a staring war. My nose started to twitch. I broke my gaze. It was a girl who lives in the house next door, I said, pointing towards it. But she's gone now. I turned my eyes toward the floor, the words falling out of my mouth. She waved at me. I raised my head and watched his eyes grow wide. Then he smiled. Brilliant, he said in English. I started to laugh, and I couldn't stop. Emil joined me. We laughed until tears began to run down our faces. After a minute, I wasn't sure if I was laughing or crying. Once, Papa brought Kobe 
Excuse me again. Oh, sorry, I'm yawning so much this morning. Once Papa brought home a British doctor who was visiting the hospital. After dinner, he and Papa smoked cigars in the living room and spoke in English while Emil and I secretly crouched by the door of our room and spied on them, trying to figure out what they were saying. We only knew a bit of English. The man kept saying the word, the word brilliant after Papa spoke. The word seemed to please Papa and made his eyes sparkle. Emil and I figured it must mean something wonderful to make Papa look so happy. Sometimes we say it to each other when no one else is listening. It's the funniest word. It feels like feathers in my mouth. I couldn't keep the girl a secret from Emil. If Emil doesn't know about it, it's like it's not really happening. And I want it to be real, Mama. Love, Misha. Page 199. September 7, 1947. Dear Mama, we waited for her together this morning when Dottie and Papa became absorbed in their reading. The girl came out but didn't look toward us. She didn't really do much of anything, just walked around in circles and occasionally squatted down and examined something on the ground. Let's give her a note somehow. Ask her to come over to the window, I whispered to him. He looked at me in surprise, his eyes twinkling with mischief. What if she tells on us? He asked as we looked at her as she now sat cross-legged on the ground, scraping the dirt with a rock. I told him she wouldn't. I believed that she would have already told on me if she wanted to. We could tell her we'll all be killed if she does, he said plainly. Page 200. My mouth hung open. Would we? Maybe it was too dangerous. We should just leave her alone. But then I felt a growing rage deep in my chest. It was okay for a strange man to put a knife at my throat, but it wasn't okay for us to speak to a little girl playing in the back of her house. I put my hands on Emil's shoulders. Everything is dangerous now anyway. All we want to do is talk to a girl. It'll be okay. Emil thought about it. Let's check and see what Papa and Dottie are doing. We headed down the hallway, through the sitting room, and into the dining room, where Dottie and Papa looked up from the table. Why are you two sneaking about? Papa said in a low, hoarse tone. We're just playing around, Emil said. Playing around? Dottie asked. I shrugged and Emil ignored her. Her color was back. That made me feel better. I sat down next to her. She patted my shoulder and folded the paper. Emil started pacing around the table, skipping a bit. Emil used to spend hours running around the gardens, playing with friends, skipping and hopping to and from school. It was awful to say, but in some ways, walking in the desert, at least when we still had water, might have been easier for him than being cooped up like this. Just as Papa looked up at Emil, the annoyance flickering in his eyes, I heard something. It was a faint sound, but not a bird. I listened closer, and I realized it was a song being sung by a child, by the girl. We all raised our heads and listened. It was the sweetest sound I had heard in so long. I think Papa, Dottie, and Emil thought so too, because we all remained quiet and still until she stopped. But I was afraid somehow they'd know what we were about to do, that they'd want to look out the window toward the sound. The girl might see them, and somehow that would be much worse than just seeing them, than her just seeing us. After a few minutes, the song ended, and Papa and Dottie started reading again, as if nothing had happened. I wondered why they did this but maybe they were afraid of our questions. Emil drifted away to our room and I followed him. We watched her again. Now she was digging a hole with a stick. Emil held out the torn edge of a newspaper in his palm. Where did you get that? From the pages Dottie gave me. We can wrap it around a little rock and throw it near her. I wouldn't go that far, I said. Then I imagined her coming over. We could talk to her out the window in whispers. We could find out things. Maybe she was as lonely as we were. I told Emil to get me a pencil after a few seconds. He quickly got one from his bag. I thought for a moment and wrote, Come to our window. We want to meet you. But don't tell anyone or bad things could happen. Emil nodded. Would Rashid Uncle's neighbors even be mad that we were here? What if Uncle was friends with them? Maybe they even knew we were here. I wondered again what the rules were exactly. Guard me, Emil said, grabbing the note and starting to climb out the window. 
Wait, I hissed at him. You're going outside? He stopped. How else am I going to get her the note? I pushed my head out the window and looked around. I couldn't see anyone else. Before I could say anything, Emil lifted both legs over the sill, and suddenly he was standing on the ground outside. My heart pounded so hard, my face throbbed. He picked up um, 203. He picked up a small rock and wrapped the note lightly, tightly around it, walked a few feet closer, and threw the rock toward the girl. She quickly glanced at it when it landed, and then looked up toward the direction it came from, startled. Emil scrambled back inside. We ducked under the window for a few seconds until we got the courage to peek over the ledge. We watched her as she slowly walked over to the rock and picked it up. She squinted in the direction of our window, unwrapped the paper, and read our words. She gazed out again toward us and narrowed her eyes. We poked our heads up farther. We've done it now, Emil said. I nodded. The girl looked away and slowly walked in our direction. We held our breath as she came closer and closer. She stepped over the low stone border and onto Uncle's property. When she stood about ten feet away, I could see she was younger than I had thought. Maybe only nine. Emil put his finger over his mouth. Whisper, he said. She nodded and came closer. Who are you? she asked. Where did the man with the broken face go? Emil looked at me with questioning eyes. Page 204. He didn't know what to say. I opened my mouth, but I felt like I would faint. I closed it. I shook my head. She doesn't like to talk, he said, pointing to me. We're from Nurprakas. Are you staying here for a long time, she asked. No, Emil said. We're on our way to the border. Oh, she said, and her eyes widened with understanding. So are you hiding here, she asked her face growing worried. I swallowed. That's why you can't tell anyone we're talking to you, Emil said. She looked around quickly in fear and started to back away. Don't go, I said in a whisper and reached out as if to grab her hand, but she wasn't close enough. Nobody is going to do anything if they don't catch us, I said, my voice a little bit louder. Emil gaped at me, his mouth hanging open. I shot him a mean look. The girl looked back and forth at us, still deciding if she wanted to stay. What's your name? I asked. Hoffa, she said shyly. I'm Nisha. This is Emil, I said. Then Emil elbowed me in the ribs. I think I heard a chair move, he said. I looked back and listened. We have to go. Come visit us tomorrow in secret. Tell no one, I said in my most serious voice. She nodded and skipped away toward her house. I heard the creaky front door open and close. That meant Rashid Uncle was home. Do you think Uncle noticed anything? Emil whispered in my ear. I don't think you can see the back of the houses from the path, but I'm not so sure, I said, again my pulse racing. But Mama, can I tell you something? I felt so happy, I didn't care. You talked to her, Emil said. I just nodded, bits of joy sparking through my limbs. Nisha, Emil, come help for dinner, Pop called from the other room. We went and watched Rashid Uncle unpack the food. There were several sweet potatoes, green beans, two onions, and two cucumbers. He never got meat, though I was craving chicken or mutton. I don't know if he didn't eat it or thought we didn't. Maybe it was too expensive. My mouth watered at the thought of eating sweet potato, though. I couldn't remember the last time I had one. I didn't know any recipes that Cosie made with them, but we could fry them with the onions and the beans. I could taste it, sweet, salty, and spicy all together. I got to work, rolling up my sleeves and clearing a place for chopping. Rashid Uncle handed me a knife. After talking to Hoffa, I felt different, like maybe I could be a new person. Thank you, I said. Rashid Uncle looked at me, surprised, and I met his eyes. He nodded and his mouth twitched. Then he started to measure the rice. We cooked quietly and afterward I spooned the fried vegetables and rice in bowls. Wonderful, Papa said, taking in the bright orange cubes of sweet potato nestled among the fried green beans and onions. Then he patted his stomach. We all ate slowly, savoring it. Emil normally shoveled his food in so fast 
I wondered how he tasted anything, but even he seemed to slow down and enjoy it. We cleared our plates and Emil and I washed everything. Papa and Dottie were having their last cup of tea for the night and Rashid's uncle sat at the table carving like he usually did. I took in a deep breath. Emil watched me. What are you making? I asked Rashid's uncle. Then I handed him his little chalkboard that he wrote on. And I'm on page 207. Dottie and Papa both put their papers down and looked at us. Rashid Uncle stopped and lowered his tool and a small piece of wood. He had just started. It didn't look like anything yet. He took the chalkboard and a piece of chalk, moving slowly, carefully. A doll, he wrote. I thought of my old doll, D, and my stomach clenched. I nodded, but then my mouth went dry, and I knew the words were stuck. My face grew hot. I shook my head. Rashid Uncle looked at me carefully, studying my face. You have your mother's mouth, he wrote. I looked up at Papa and Dottie. They seemed frozen. Emil moved closer to me. And you, your mother's eyes, he wrote and held it up toward Emil. Emil touched the corner of his eye. It makes me so happy to see your faces, he continued. He knew her. He could see her in our faces. It was like another universe had opened. Page 208. Did you, was she, Emil stuttered. Was she good to you, he asked. Rashid uncle nodded. She loved you both before you were born, he wrote. I heard a little moan from Dottie like she was crying. I heard Papa clear his throat. My body felt like it was melting. Thank you, I whispered. It was the answer I had always wanted to hear. It almost made everything we had been through worth it. The tearing of India, the tearing of walls, then opening of something new, of this. You loved us, Mama. Love, Nisha. Oh my goodness. I just love those last two pages. Everything comes together. Um, I, the note that I made here in the last part when she tells um, Rashid uncle thank you and says it was the answer she'd always wanted to hear and it just makes everything worth it, right? We see a continued shift of perspective from Nisha about the situation. We also see how initially that separation of the home, of the religions, brought her to this new unification, not only with, with Rashid uncle, but with her mom. And I think it's just so beautiful how the author develops that through this, through these entries here that we see from August 31st through September 7th. Um, so that's the end of this reading. And I really had to fight back the tears those last two pages because they are, it's just such beautiful writing um, by Vera Heeren and Donnie. So um, think about that. Uh, if you have questions, email me, get on one of the Zoom calls. And I will see you back next week for our next set of entries. Bye.